Well, thanks for coming to this summit. My job is to try to lay out why there's a problem here with respect to opportunity. There's been a lot of conversation this election season about equality. Most of it focused on what you might call equality of outcome, that is, equality within the current generation, people having more money or less money within the current generation. Americans have historically not worried a whole lot about disparities of income. We don't typically mind if they're really rich people. We don't care how high the ladder is because we assume everybody's getting on the ladder at about the same point, and then some people will climb faster or be better climbers, work harder, and get up higher on the ladder. But that all assumes that we're all getting on the ladder at about the same point. That we do care about, and that is the problem that America is now facing. We're not getting on, we're, not, we're nowhere near getting on the ladder at the same point. There's been, indeed, a shocking change in American, in the lives of American young people over the last 30 years that portend a significant, sharp drop in social mobility, in the opportunities for advancement for kids coming from the less well-off part of the population. We are facing an opportunity cliff in the next couple of years in which uh, social mobility, up the chances of social mobility from the lower part of the population decline sharply. It's not going to happen quite as quickly as the fiscal cliff that everybody talks about next January, but it's going to be much more damaging to the long-run future of our society. Let me say a little bit about the evidence that leads me to this pretty dire perspective on the chances for equality of opportunity going forward. First of all, over the last 30 or 40 years, there have been a series of growing gaps between our kids coming from upper middle class backgrounds, kids coming from college educated backgrounds, basically the upper third of American society, and kids coming from less well off backgrounds, the lower third of American society, the, roughly speaking, kids coming from homes where nobody's gone past high school in terms of their education level. 30 years ago, there was not much of a gap in test scores between kids coming from those two different sorts of backgrounds. But over the last 30 years, there's been a sharply increasing gap in test scores between kids coming from well-off backgrounds and kids coming from the lower third of the population. But it's not just test scores. There's been a significant change in the amount of time that parents spend with their own children, what we in my research project call good night moon time. Um, middle, middle class parents are spending a lot more time with their kids than they used to, and working class parents are spending not a lot more time than they used to with their kids. So there's now an average of an hour gap in parental time every day between a kid coming from a, a college-educated family and a kid coming from a less, a less well-educated family. But it's not just time with kids, it's not just investments of time. Middle-class kids are, middle-class parents are investing a lot more money in their kids, about $5,000 a year over the last 20 or 30 years, $5,000 a year in, uh, in spending on their, on, for development of their kids, going to summer camp and, and that sort of thing. Um, the same, in constant dollars, there's been about a $500, less than a $500 increase in the spending of families that are less well off. But it's not just inside the family. S take, taking part in all sorts of extracurricular activities, you see the same growing gap. Middle class kids, kids coming from college, educa from college educated backgrounds, are much more likely to be in band and chorus and football and French club and so on, much more likely. And working class kids over that same period have become much less likely to be involved in band and chorus and even, even athletics. Or how about community organizations like taking part in the scouts or, or volunteering for other community organizations? Up for middle class kids, down for working class kids. Um, or how about going to church? Up for middle class kids, way down for working class kids. Um, how about uh, just trusting your environment? trusting people that you're around, up or steady for middle class kids, but way down for working class kids. Well, why not? Every institution in society is increasingly failing those working class kids, family, community, church, schools. And, all, and the, this is the worst part of it. All of the things that I've just mentioned predict success in life. Going to church, being involved in community organizations, uh, getting high test scores, uh, spending time with mom and dad, all of those things in, are increasingly concentrated among kids coming from one part of our society. And what that means is, and this is the sharpest way to put this point, increasingly going forward over the next 20 or 30 years in America, how well you do in life 
will depend upon one decision you make, choosing your parents. If you're, <laughs> if you're smart and alert when parents are being chosen and you pick college-educated parents, you're set for life. But if you're asleep on the day when parents are chosen, or you know, you, don't, you kind of blow it off and say, I don't care, I'll take whatever you've got there, and you end up with a high school educated parent, your goose is cooked and you haven't even done a thing. Now, there are two reasons why that's a problem. First of all, it just isn't fair. It's not fair to have your, your life chances be dependent upon how you, how you did in the parental lottery. And secondly, it's, at, it's dumb from a national standpoint because we cannot write off one third of our whole population uh, and still expect to be internationally competitive. How did this happen? It's a, it, this is a purple problem. This is a problem some of whose causes you see most clearly through red conservative lenses. It has to do with the breakdown of the working class, the white working class family. By the way, I should say, I've been talking about class all the time, and I hope you are not translating that directly into race. Race is related, but the changes I'm talking about are not about race, they're about class. They are show up in all races of America, this growing gap that I've been talking about. Part of it, as I say, the causes are seen most clearly through a red conservative lens. Part of them, the causes are seen most clearly through a blue lens, and that's the collapse of the, of the working wage the economy for working class Americans. And part of it has to do with changes in the, in the neighborhoods and communities. I think the most important underlying cause, however, is this. When I was growing up, when parents in my hometown, small town in Ohio, talked about our kids, they used the phrase our kids, they meant all of the kids in the community. The, our kids were the kids in town. Now when we talk about our kids, we mean my kids, my biological kids. Over the last 30 years, there's been a shrinkage of whose kids we're worried about. And we don't worry about, you know, the kids of those, those other people down the block who are, who are they're, they're less well off. The parents in, these, in some of these working class families may not be entirely uh, admirable people, but the kids didn't cause the problem. And it, they're our kids too. So I think this is a huge challenge for America going forward. Michael? First of all, before I have any reaction, let me say what a real honor it is to be not just with you, um, but to be with one of the scholars of broad influence and deep humanity on these issues. So I, I really appreciate being with Bob. Um, the good news in this election, as you mentioned, is we are having a sort of debate on opportunity. The bad news is how unbelievably and distressingly shallow it is. Um, you know, we've heard talk of makers and takers and the 47% and the lazy language of libertarianism. Um, and we've also hear some of the easy language of egalitarianism in, 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 these, uh, in these debates. I, people, I think, are genuinely disturbed about something being lost. You see it in the Tea Party where they think it's government oppression causing this. You see it in Occupy Wall Street, where it's more a uh, small group of economic elites that are causing fundamental changes in American society. But the anxiety is very real. Um, the problem is that we don't have a political debate that's sufficient uh, to that uh, deep provocation. Um, while I, I've been involved, I spend my days looking at political life um, I was looking at your um, research, uh, some of which took place in your hometown, I think, in Ohio, um, Fort Cl Clinton, um, where one of your interviewers uh, talked to a real woman with a fictitious name of Mary Sue, um, whose parents had divorced when she was small, whose mother had taken up stripping and left her for days at a time, whose stepmother beat her. Um, and confined her to a single room, who uh, was, you know, went to juvenile detention uh, for, for selling pot, who had boyfriend, a boyfriend who burned her arms with cigarettes. Um, and uh, she told the story of being in that apartment and her friend being a yellow mouse 
her only contact. Um, and it was a story that when you look at the poor quality of our public debate and you look at the reality, the human reality um, of so many people in America, it, asked, it raises the question, um, what does opportunity really mean in a circumstance like that? And why is our political debate not capable of dealing uh, with the human reality? Um, now I would give several reasons. I don't want to take too much time. One of them is that we have a political system that's focused on the middle class. You hear that among Democrats and Republicans. Political advisors tell you that's where the votes are. It's a strange inversion of the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the middle class, for they shall receive the biggest tax reductions. Um, <laughs> And I, but there's also an ideological problem here um, where you have uh, a, a situation where Republicans, I think, have adopted a kind of basic libertarian approach um, and because they lack a language to talk about, about this. Um, and you often have a, a perception that the options, the social options are between rugged individualism and bureaucratic centralization. And it ignores the fact that opportunity comes from different places. Um, um, and one way to put it, it might be, we, are, we own what we build. But as human beings, we're also built. Okay? Not only by government, by but by institutions, families and religious congregations and orderly hopeful neighborhoods um, that shape or extinguish our ambitions and dreams. Um, and in this way, the opportunity gap, the debate on this does have an advantage of sorts. Both liberals and conservatives have something to offer here, as, as you mentioned. Values and family are central to opportunity. So are communities with decent jobs at decent pay. Um, so is our working public schools and higher education. So are stable communities where religious institutions take a really leading role. So is health. So is wealth building and entrepreneurship. Um, Eventually, the political class is going to be forced to deal with the opportunity gap because it's worsening and because it's fundamentally inconsistent with the American ideal. Um, the question is whether it, uh, creative people are going to be ready with the ideas that are necessary um, to begin to bridge these problems. And I think that's where Opportunity Nation comes in and, and others. Um, this is not the best political time for, to debate these issues, but the time will come. And the question is whether the policy community will be prepared um, for the necessary work to save the American idea. Um, and so that's why I appreciate what all of you are doing here, and particularly the way that Bob is drawing attention to these issues. So thank you.